In this video, we're going to introduce the key test signals that we're going to use for probing the signal processing systems. We're going to look at a toolbox of signals, including the delta function, unit step, unit pulse, sinusoids, and real exponential, along with applications. It's important to note that we are going to define our test signals as infinite length, but in fact, each one has a finite length counterpart that is really clear, and how to define it. So let's start by talking about the delta function, which is the simplest non-trivial signal. And it's simply a signal, that is zero for all time, except at time point n equals zero, it peaks up to the value one. So mathematically, we say that a delta pulse, or function is zero for all time, except it peaks up to the value, one at n equals zero. Very handy signal, especially when we think of shifting it. So now, if we think of the shifted delta function, delta of n minus m where m is an integer, it is going to peak up at the time point n equals m. And the reason for that is, the delta function peaks up to a value of one when the argument inside the square brackets equals zero. So this shift of delta pulse will peak up when the argument inside, n minus m, equals zero, or precisely, when n, equals m. So here's a, picture of a delta pulse, with m, equals nine. And we see that at zero, for all time, except at the time point, n equals nine where it jumps up to the value, one. Delta functions are very useful, and one of the reasons they're useful is for sampling signals. If we multiply a signal by a shifted delta function, it's basically going to pick out one sample of the time signal, and set all the other entries to zero. And the simplest way to see this is, just with some pictures. Here's our signal, x of n. And what we're going to do, is to multiply it by a delta, function a shifted delta function, with, n equals 9, in this case, which is 0 for all time and peaks up at the value, n equals 9, to the height 1. And now it should be pretty clear that, we multiply signals just by basically multiplying vertically, taking a time index, say minus 10, multiplying this particular value of x, x of minus 10. We're going to multiply it by the value of the delta, function, which is going to be zero. And for basically all values of the signal, we're basically going to get zero values here in the product. The only place, where we're going to have a non-zero value is precisely at the index nine, where we'll basically take the product of the time signal x, at time point nine, multiplied by one. And basically, we will have in this signal basically a signal that is all zero, except, at the time point nine, it is going to jump up to the value x at time point nine. And the really, really important thing here, is that x, at time point nine is a number? It's not a signal anymore. It's just a number. And we can write, this more generally for any m, not just nine, as follows. We can say that if we multiply a signal, x of n, by a delta pulse, that is shifted to peak up at the time point m, then that is equal to the exact same delta function, but now multiplied not by a signal anymore, x of n, but multiplied simply by a number x of m. And that's what we mean by sampling, that multiplying a signal with a shifted delta pulse basically, just shifts out or pulls out this sample x at the time point m. So delta function sample, the unit step is, may be, the second simplest signal. It's simply a signal that is zero for negative time and then takes a value one for positive time. So zero for negative time, one for positive time. And similarly to the delta function, if we shift the unit step by an integer m, then it will basically peak up not at the time point, n equals zero, but at the time point, m. Or in this case, we see, m equals, 5. So shifted unit steps are useful. And multiplying unit steps by a signal is handy, because it basically zeros out the entries in the signal for time indices, n less than m, just to see this with an example. 
and a simple example, here's my signal, x of n, and we multiply by a unit step, in this case with, m equals 5. So we've shifted it by 5 units. Now when we multiply, x by this shifted unit step, we see we're going to get an output signal that is 0, for times up to n, equals plus 4. And n basically then equals the signal, x of n for time points 5, and greater. So basically, selects out a part of, the signal. Now, that was the unit step. The unit pulse, is basically kind of like a two-sided unit step. It's a signal now that is zero for negative time. It jumps up to the value one for some amount of time, and then jumps back down to zero for all positive time. Mathematically, the unit pulse, P of n, again equals one between the indices, n1 and n2. Here's n1. Here's n2. And it equals zero below n1, over here and it equals zero above n2, over, here. And there's many ways that you can formulate the unit pulse in terms of unit steps. One particular formula is that basically, you can form a unit pulse as the difference, the subtraction, of two unit pulses, the first of which peaks up, at the lower index, and the second of which, peaks up just above the upper index. And you see if we subtract the green curve from there, blue curve, we will in, fact achieve a unit pulse. And this is really quite a handy signal as well. The real exponential is a signal, that's formed by exponentiating a constant. So now that the time variable n, is basically the exponent that's applied to a positive real number. So a is just a positive real number. And there's two flavors of the real exponential depending on whether, a is positive, or rather a, is greater than 1 or between 0 and 1. So when a is greater than 1, our real, exponential is basically going to explode towards the right. It's going to reach infinitely large values, as time grows towards infinity. And then it's going to die down to 0, as time becomes largely negative. When it is between 0 and 1, the situation is reversed, and we basically have a situation where the signal will grow towards infinity to the left, and then shrink to 0 to the right. And, these are just two examples here. A is 0 0.9 between 0 and 1. And in this example, A is 1.1. So that's the real exponential. Next, we're going to introduce sine waves or sinusoids, which are incredibly useful both as test functions for probing the discrete time signal processing systems, and also as basis functions for the various Fourier transform representations. In this video, we're going to think of them mainly as test functions. It's very simple to define the two key, real valued sine waves, the cosine wave, and, the sine wave. The two parameters of these signals are the frequency, omega, and the phase, phi. And to compute a sine wave, or generate a sine wave, we simply take the time index, n, that's varying as an integer, we multiply the time index by the fixed frequency, omega, that has units of radians per sample. And then we add the phase, phi, which has units of radians. Then for each time point, n. In the integers, we then simply perform this product, this sum, and then take the cosine or the sine of that argument. And what is seen is, two oscillating functions, in this case the cosine wave, and the sine wave. These oscillate. They oscillate, more quickly as we increase the frequency, omega. And as we'll see in a little bit, the phase shifts these signals back and forth in time. Very, very. Importantly, we can see that the cosine wave, has an even symmetry, meaning if we look at the reflection across the, n equals zero axis, we see that we have an even symmetric signal, whereas the sine wave has an odd symmetry, meaning if we look across the n equals zero time axis we also have to negate the value in order to get the other half of the sine wave. So those are sine waves. Some simple examples. Cosine of zero n. So here, omega equals zero. We have different frequencies. We see the signals very simple. 
it doesn't oscillate at all. Sine with the same frequency also doesn't oscillate at all, but it also takes the value 0 for all time. Here's an example of sine with frequency, pi over 4, and phase of, 2 pi over 6. And we see that it is again an, oscillating signal with a certain oscillation frequency. And this is an interesting signal at the bottom. Cosine of pi n, you see is an oscillation between a plus and minus 1. Basically, oscillating very, very quickly. So these are examples of discrete time sine waves. Finally, in this video, we introduced a toolbox of key test signals, including the delta function, unit step, unit pulse, sinusoids, and real exponential. We're going to use these test signals a lot, especially the delta function and unit step. And again, it's really important to remember that multiplying by a delta function basically samples a signal, and multiplying by a unit step selects just part of a signal. Please support by, like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching.